Hey Tall Skulls, Nick here. Sorry to have to do this again, but it's Omen's fault this time. So, there's that. So, Omen's recording was not up to wonderful standards, and he's got some feedback and some fuzz and some white noise. I've done my best to edit it out and put silence in where it, it's supposed to be, but there's always going to be a little bit of fuzz in his speech for this episode. So please bear with us. We're going to address it. We're going to make it better. You shouldn't have to listen to fuzz. We're better than that. And you deserve better. So thank you for sticking with us. Enjoy. Talk to you soon. Ladies and gentlemen, reject intoxicants, steal from the best, and spill a drop of madness into the reservoir. Because it's time to talk tull to me. I'm Omen Said. And I am Nick McGill. We are Feckless Momes. And this is Talk Tall to Me, a Modge Podge collage of <laughs> stories, songs, reminiscements, and feelings about the work of Jethro Tull throughout the ages. We have been reminiscing for over a year now. This is our fifth album, and we are... We're set in our tracks at this point. There's no stopping this train. We are... Charlie has broken off our handle and we're going strong. You know what I should have said? I should have said a Maj Podge decollage collage. Oh no. That's just, that's just redundant. It's ma- Mod Mod Podge. I can't say my G's. <laughs> I've never been able to say them. Uh, yeah, a little known fact about you, actually. Yeah. You Lufus... You orc. So, Nick. Yeah, Omen. We are in some some kind of liminal territory here, aren't we? Yep, yep, we are in the in-between. This is our jaunt into the... We're dipping our toes into living in the past. This song is actually the first track off of the second album because it's a two album set so a second is it a disc the second vinyl i guess yeah second vinyl it's the first track off of the a side of the second vinyl of living in the past yeah and for those of you who weren't paying attention to the end of our episode last week shameful well who who do you think you are <laughs> we are we're going to be talking tall to you about only the tracks off of Living on the Past, Living in the Past, which we have not previously covered in the other albums. Right. So, Nick, with that being said, what do we have the pleasure of talking tall about today? This week, we are going to talk tall about By Kind Permission of. Let's have a listen. Let us. Wowza. That is 10 minute. That's a 10 minute roller coaster ride. For sure. Yeah. Now, Nick, why don't we start with some facts? Yeah. Yeah. I think that is that is important. So this song was recorded when exactly? Oh, gosh. Uh, 71, 72. Do you have the actual information? I'm looking. <laughs> okay. I was I wasn't prepared. November fourth, nineteen seventy. Oh, seventy. Okay. Kind permission of uh, was recorded live along with Dharma for one. Uh huh. At an anti-drug benefit at Carnegie Hall. Yeah. On November fourth, nineteen seventy, during the tour for benefit. Wow. Okay. And it's very funny that this was for 
a an anti drug benefit, and we we know Tull's background. We know Ian Anderson's feelings about about drug usage and whatnot. So it makes sense that they'd be there. Doesn't like it. He's not terribly fond. Mm. But the the start the banter the starting banter of this song is. <sighs> Ian saying that John was dropped on his head as a child. Right. And they sometimes cut off his fingernails and smoke them. Yeah, well, and also that he can't open something that's just been given to him, perhaps, because it might have contraband in it. Oh, yeah. Hello, hang on a present. Be back with you in a minute. I better not open this now, because it might contain contraband. I'll give it to John, supplement his camels, right? He dropped on his head when he was very small. We occasionally cut his fingernails off and smoke them. But there's a, a song about, about everything. The laughter following these jokes is a, a bit reserved, I would say. Right. It's not terribly <laughs> raucous. I'm not sure he's playing to the right crowd. It's just, it's just an interesting glimpse into... The kind of awkwardness that that Ian has on stage. That's a great way of saying it. Yeah, and it's it's almost as if he can't help but undermine anything that's institutional at all, even if it's something that he agrees with. <laughs> right, right, and he's doing something to benefit raising money for. <laughs> right, still, right, right. He's still got to <laughs> right. like poke it a little bit. I agree with your methods. I agree with your philosophy, but I'm going to make you feel uncomfortable. Yep, and by golly, I'm going to do it well. Yeah. Also worth noting, John Evan had literally just joined the band at this point. Oh, yeah. I mean, he'd been playing with them for mere months. He he was still in his probationary period at this point. Yeah. Yeah, they're like, keep those fingernails coming and maybe we'll talk. <laughs> yeah, you pay us in fingernails to be a part of Jethro Tull. Yikes. <laughs> so frightening. It puts the lotion in the basket. But <laughs> Oh, my. <laughs> Now, Carnegie Hall is in my Car- fair city of Carnegie. New York. Oh. No. <laughs> Which is funny. I'm, I'm wondering, Nick, do you... How, how good a grasp of 20th century American history do you have? Is this, is this during the sort of war on drugs movement? That was Nancy Reagan, so that was 80s, I believe. Okay, so yeah. this, was the, this was the drugs on war in the in the 70s yeah maybe i don't know there was no war there was just drugs yep i suppose so it was the drugs on drugs movement is i think what it was i think that's what they called it it had a great ring the advertising campaign just was really solid for sure and so unnecessary too (laughs) they they sell themselves guys (laughs) they they do (laughs) yeah so interesting i mean new york city during the 70s this is when Times Square was where you went to get with a lady of the evening uh-huh. or see a, um, see a porn video. Yeah, that's, that was, those were your options. Or to buy a drug. A single. Yeah. I'd like one drug, please. I'll have your finest drug. I am here to inquire after some drug. <laughs> oh, yes, sir. Right away, right away. <laughs> it's a, a drug concierge. I'd like a heroin martini. <laughs> Shaken. And injected. Shaken and injected. No bubbles, please. <laughs> oh, yeah. So all that being <laughs> said for some reason, let's... Uh, <laughs> We're not sure why. Let's talk, about the, let's talk about the piece. So there are no lyrics. This is a purely instrumental piece. Mm-hmm. And this is perhaps unique thus far in our entire catalog of what we've covered in that the composition of this piece is not credited to Ian Anderson. Yeah. Yeah. I, I really, I really like this piece. And I think we mentioned it in, in the last episode where we're starting to really see John as a pianist. Yeah. And granted this was before, the recording of wind up but still it's it's nice to see that that he, he they he's a pianist for a reason like he's really good he's really yeah, really good it's fun 
in this because he plays with several different styles. And this is obviously, I mean, to me, this is a piece that he has, that he created and that maybe he even brought to the table, maybe that he was working on before his tenure with Jeff Rotel. Oh, it's possible, sure. But it is really wonderful to hear his classical chops yeah. in the first in the first little bit. Yeah, that man can play a piano, which is fortunately his job. That's on his business card. J- yes. John Evan can play the piano. Why don't we have John Nevin play the piano? Well, that's that's all he can do. The piano is is it's just it's center stage. Every now and then we get a little flute to in there, but for the most part, it's it is a John Evan joint. The last minute of the ten minute piece, the drums and Martin Barr come in. Oh my! Really? I didn't even notice that. Bunker and Barr come in just for a hot second, literally for, for 60 hot seconds. Wow. And the bass. Go! Okay, Omen, who was on bass at this point? On first base or second base? <laughs> Glenn Cornick. Thank you. <laughs> yes. I didn't think we would be going back to the previous lineup, and so I deleted the previous lineup you from panicked, my mind. yeah. I did panic. You heard it. <laughs> but, but as you say, this is 90% John Evan, the John Evan finger experience. <laughs> oh. oh, mercy. <laughs> That was actually the first band name, and <laughs> <laughs> it was popular with with just John Evan. <laughs> <laughs> Concert for one. <laughs> so, Nick, this song, this piece is is somewhat maddening for me. I have to say, is it really? It's it's yeah. It it listening to it for the first time, I was agitated and uncomfortable with myself okay because there are clearly references to or phrases and themes taken from Mm. lots of different lots of different other composers lots of different songs yep it feels like there's a lot of winks in there and i was not able to identify hardly any of them which yeah. which which infuriated me i feel i feel like a i feel like i've let you down omen i yeah. was not expecting you to bear the brunt of this altogether okay so i don't want you to feel that way great do you have a, a handle on the brunt do you have your brunt gloves on i i prefer to go bareback with the brunt mm-hmm. i'm not gonna lie i know it's not a traditional way to approach it but i think it's very traditional you know it's it's the way of my people so yeah yeah you are the bear the bear brunt the bear brunters <laughs> the only thing i was able to identify is and i don't know this i don't know the specific piece but at a certain at about the five minute mark i think he is he plays a, a little riff from our friend our friend who never comes out because he's Highly antisocial Claude Debussy. Mm, I I love some Debussy. I I genuinely do. Before we go any further, is this the first time you've heard this song? This is the first time I've heard this song. Well, okay. Ten minutes ago well, was the first yeah. time I've heard this, this piece. Yeah. That is all. We can end the podcast now. And goodbye. I am Omen Sade. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, again, there there are clearly winks. They're clearly an elbow to the ribs going, ah, ah, you see what I'm doing here? 
but I don't know any of them. Do you, Claude Debussy, what I've done? <laughs> he also, at the, at the very end, they throw in a little reference to Benefit. I think they reference several Jethro Tull songs very quickly back to back. Mm. have the little which is like from something previously one <laughs> one of the manic flute pieces from yeah. this was yeah. is that cats oh that's dharma yeah yeah, yeah. dharma dharma for flute dharma f- flute f- flute flutey dharmas flute for one yep interesting however that dharma that there's a reference to dharma there and then also in this concert they they play dharma yeah i wonder which one they played first i guess they played dharma second because they were just introduced oh yeah that's that's valid good context strange clues. opener did you say strange odor i did not <laughs> no for once i would i said i said strange opener strange strange piece to begin with Oh. Here's Jethro Tull, and now we will play a 10-minute segment that's pretty much just our pianist who just started with us. He doesn't intro it with that, you know? Here's the Beatles, and now Ringo Starr plays a 10-minute drum solo. Or or just plays Octopus Garden. But just the drum part. <laughs> yeah. Well, he wrote Octopus Garden, so it's... Oh, did he? And he sings in it, yeah. He wrote all the super oh. weird ones, yeah. Oh, look at him. Good old Ringo. Good old Ringo. He got a, a scratch and sniff snicker. Scratch it. Uh, uh, s- he got a scratch uh, and sniff sticker for that song. Yeah. And this is Grape Job, and it's a bunch of grapes. <laughs> I love that sticker. <laughs> so did he. He still has it. <laughs> it's almost as good as Orange, you proud of your work? That sticker is so big, though, because it's really it's pretty verbose. <laughs> so much text, yeah. <laughs> Which is good, because there's always a bit left to scratch and snip. That's true. There you go. When you need your fix. When you need your orange, your fake orange-scented sticker fix. Yeah. Speaking of Jethro Tull. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Those guys. What else is there to say about this song, Nick? I love this. I love the piano this is ostensibly this is the drum solo for Dharma for One, but it's on piano instead. It's just a it's it's a piano solo, but I can listen to this so much more than I can listen to a drum solo. Well, you know, the piano has notes, which is nice. But a drum has different drums. Yeah, but no one like there's no there's no drum concerti. Aren't there? No. <laughs> no. No, seriously, aren't there? <laughs> <laughs> the great thing about the piano is that it's like it's like a whole orchestra. Yeah. That's why they invented it. It's it it has it has more than one note. That's why that's why Madame Piano decided to create it. You know what? I'm gonna I w I'm I'll stand by. I'm gonna look up who else played this concert. Oh, that's some good info. While you're doing that, I'll, I'll just, I'll read the rest of my notes. I like how sweeping the whole piece is. It's, and it's not always stable. He, he, he stops and he starts and he speeds up and he slows down. It, there's so much flavor and texture in it. I, even though it's a 10 minute song, I'm listening the whole way through for something like. Yeah, it's composed. It's composed in such a way that it keeps recaptivating the attention. Yeah. Yeah, for something going back to Aqualung, for something like Aqualung or Locomotive Breath or Wind Up, even though they're they're shorter songs, I zone out after about halfway through on those songs. Right. But this one this one is is built more effectively, I suppose. And those spots when the flute comes in are really nice and I really appreciate 
that the flute is clearly there as a support instrument. And it's not Ian being like, all right, here I come. He's really taking the support role there. And he just, it's its nice to hear that, probably for the only time in any Tall song. Yeah, it is really it is really unusual that he let someone else have center stage but he but he, of course he doesn't do it without throwing some serious shade john evans way beforehand yeah right oh of course of course just like when we heard the martin Barr intro a couple of weeks ago for i was Mother just thinking Goose. about that yep yeah and the the last two notes I have is he refers to Ian refers to it as a song about everything. Yeah. What do you think he means by that? Is that saying I didn't write this? I don't know anything about this song. Like it or love it or, or hate it. I, I don't. It's not in my hands. It, it, it feels a little bit like he's washing his hands of it and making an excuse for it. That being said, also, it may be like pulling in Debussy and pulling in a couple of tall songs. You know, maybe that's the reference is that that it has these different references and homages. So I'm trying to get some information on this concert, and it looks like they played a full set. Oh, so it was just them. It wasn't like a benefit of like everybody comes in. I I guess not. It looks like they played Nothing Is Easy, My God. With You There to Help Me, by kind permission of, A Song for Jeffrey to Cry You a Song, Saucity, as an acoustic melody with reasons for waiting. Oh, I would love to hear that. Dharma for One, We Used to Know, Guitar Solo with a Full Band Instrumental Jam, mm. very mysterious, and For a Thousand Mothers. What's the, is there a specific name for this event? It says, Charity Concert in Aid of the Phoenix House Drug Rehabilitation Center. Huh. And this was in 70? 1970, November 4th. Huh. Well, I mean, as we we mentioned a couple of episodes ago, Ian, uh, apparently for the last 50 years, he's been doing charity concerts because he does it now for, for cathedrals. Right. So it's it's a way to it's a way to help support a cause without actually giving them money. You're giving them your time and they get to keep the money yeah, kind of thing. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, also live at Carnegie Hall 1970 was later released as a full album. Is that this album? No, no, okay. no, no. It was okay. it was later released in 2015. That was released. All the songs that they played in this concert were released as an album. Okay, so that's this concert. Sorry, it's not the album. So this does exist as a legitimate album. So we can actually find it and go hear that guitar solo with the band in the back or the Saucity slash Reasons for Waiting acoustic or or piece, whatever you said it was. Now I think we have some tough decisions uh, ahead of us, Nick. Are these these tracks that we're going to track down? And are we going to track them down... And put them in now because that's when they were recorded? Or are we going to wait until we are in the the late 2000s when they were released? Oof. I don't think we're going to be doing... If the song exists on an an album, we're not going to do a live version of it. We're not going to redo it. Yeah. Gotcha. But what about the mysterious guitar solo? Oh. I think we just all need to track that down and listen, and we'll all have that for ourselves. Okay. That sounds good. (laughs) The only exception, I'm going to say, the only exception is next week is the version of Dharma for One that they did with lyrics. Gotcha. Yeah. And that makes sense. And because that version of that song in this concert is so freaking good. Yeah. It's so good. Nick, let me ask you something. Yes. 
Have you ever performed or donated your time otherwise for charity? Yeah. I, wouldn't you say Casey's Cottage was was a, a donation of our time? We didn't get paid for that. I would say that. And would you like to describe for everyone what Casey's Cottage was? I think you would do it much no, more no, eloquently no, no. than I no, would. No, no, no. I want to hear you do it. <laughs> tell them what we used to do, Nick. So Casey's... Oh, oh, I could tell them what we did. You tell them what the evening was. Casey's Cottage is a historical cottage in my hometown of Mexico, New York. It used to be the carriage house for a famous hotel on the lake shore, which was very popular in the 1930s because and 20s because they had illegal booze there from alcohol during Prohibition. Later on, the cottage was turned into a, an incredible piece of art by, um, by a sculptor. And back when we were teenagers, there was an event held there called a Midsummer Night's Eve? Or a Midsummer's Eve? Something along those lines? Which was a... It was a medieval feast evening. And Nick and I were often the entertainment. The cottage itself is just is really gorgeous, really beautiful piece of piece of art. And this is this is where we became feckless momes, actually. It's true. We it's created true. feckless momes for this and another benefit, the arts in the park. Right. Where we would in the style, in the rough style of Commedia dell'arte put on shows we would we yeah. would be characters and we would we would generally take a shakespeare and turn it into a two man what 15 20 minute show yeah or sometimes 30 second show 30 seconds with a lot of physical humor a lot of clowning a lot of slapping each other with wet handkerchiefs and yeah. masks we used mask Yep. Yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. It was some of the the best performance I've ever done, for sure. I had so much fun doing that stuff. And it was some of the only performance those people ever saw. True. Very true. And people loved it. Yeah. People people really enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that definitely counts. I once in college stripped at a charity event. <laughs> it was actually for nuns. And <laughs> they just wanted to get together and paint I a still life. And Omen busted in in his Who priest Who ordered outfit. a pizza? <laughs> Who ordered this holy pizza? No, I don't really remember what the charity was for. I think it may have been um, one of our local student theater organizations. Uh -huh. But I do remember thinking, wow, this is not as easy as those professional guys make it look what stripping yeah it's an art form it's not just taking off your clothes it's dance it's a it's a very intensive dance yeah and there's a lot of technique a lot of artistry that goes into it a lot of design composition and uh, i was i was woefully ill-prepared for all of that <laughs> you you just thought oh i could do it yeah i still yeah. made like 50 bucks I thought you 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 did it for charity. I made fifty bucks for the charity. Oh, everything that you got out of it, I took out of my remaining piece of clothing and gave to the organizers of the event. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And um, they aired they aired it out and put it in their account. <laughs> they threw it in the dryer, hit it with an iron, and it was good. Yeah. Spritzed it with a little, little bit of bleach. A little Febreze, a little bleach. Bleach. <laughs> Good to go. Speaking of Jethro Tull. Speaking of Jethro Tull. Nick, anything else to say about with kind permission? Um, I don't think so. I just, I think it's a really nice piece. It feels really, it feels Tull adjacent. I would agree. There, there are elements of Tull, but yeah. for the most part, it feels like a unique entity on its own. And I'm not, that's not a bad thing. It's, it's really refreshing to hear, to be honest. Absolutely. Yeah. I am irked that I don't know all the references. Oh, it is worth noting that Ian, at, a very, at one point in one of his interviews, did say that 
John Evan, especially in the early days of being on the band, was a bit more of a partier than the rest of them. Not, mm. not that it sounds like he was really that much of a partier, but I think that some of that, some of those digs against against him, that may be where it's coming from. Sure. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. So, Nick, what are we listening to next week? So, next week is going to be the live with lyrics version of Dharma for One. How exciting. Yeah, very, very exciting. I'm very much looking forward to hearing hearing your reaction to this song, this version. I'm very excited to reacting to the lyrics for you. <laughs> because I'm nothing but a chimp to dance for you and entertain you. And I want peanuts, goddamn. <laughs> Until next week, I remain Omen Sade. I give you permission to give us a review. Who who are you? By kind permission, Nick McGill grants you the opportunity to give us five stars and a review. We are Feckless Moms. And this is Talk Tall to Me. <laughs> Woo! Yeah! Yes, thank you, thank you. Um, Woo! this is, uh... This is Talk Tull to Me, and yeah. sometimes we we take its uh, we take the ends yeah. of its hair oh. and mix it into a syringe and inject it into the corners of our eyeballs. Shh. Yep, our eyeballs are a proud member of the Feckless Moms Radio Network. Feckless Moms, which we sometimes dry out and uh, put into a spoon, Ooh. hold it over a candle. Oh yeah. And injected up our bums. Oh, snap! We do that too. Oh, woo! It's the audio network.